प्लीज गो एड्स नमस्ते एवरीबॉडी आई एम थैंकफुल टू द ऑर्गेनाइजर्स ऑफ वेव्स 22 uh thematically innovative uh, applications of uh, vedic knowledge in today's world so uh, my paper is uh, on vedic upanishadic notion of reality so this is the area which i would like to explore now uh, what does the term reality uh, mean for us generally it happens that uh, in the uh, anglophone world reality is understood as exist existing as a fact or a thing without imagination and imitations so uh, it can be located in space and time and be the categories like quantity quality relation cause etc etc can be there but in indian tradition the notion of reality is much wider than the way it is understood in the west in india we call it as satya vastava yatharth purusharth vyavhar parmarth sajatiya vijatiya swagat bhed rahit so these are very broad connotations of reality and all these connotations we find in the vedas and uh, because vedas are the repository you know are the storehouse of all kinds of knowledge but what do you do of the storehouse you need to arrange it so the arrangement has been done in the process so like upanishads uh, they become the repository of uh, vedic wisdom and then we have all kinds of sutra period and uh, bhashyakaras and everything else so generally it happens that uh, vedas are the storehouse upanishads are the explorations of the reality and uh, sutras are the compilations of uh, various positions on reality and bhashya is the comparison of one co one concept of reality with that of another one now how do we uh, go about it <coughs> the method of compilation so it should be uh, some kind of a chronology has to be there that chronology could be normative it could be thematic and it could also be conceptual so <clears throat> this is the methodological dimension which which i have about reality at hand <clears throat> now how to see the reality in, in terms of uh, uh, you know concepts or the categories which are there before us so here uh, i propose that uh, reality can be understood in three ways uh, <coughs> monism uh, dualism neutral monism pluralism pluralism these are the various ways that reality can be articulated in monism reality is considered as one particularly in vedanta tradition in dualism we have sankhya philosophy and uh, <coughs> neutral monism we have buddhism and uh, many other such systems <coughs> excuse me. so uh, in pluralism we find nyay and other such systems and uh, before us now vedic rishis they have tried to articulate the notion of reality in three ways one is the cosmological way of looking at it so when we look at the universe as such and the other is the uh, psychological way of looking at it when we look at what goes on inside us that also gives a, a picture of reality and <coughs> the third one is when we look at god god as the basis of all kinds of reality before us so this these are the three ways that reality can be articulated the first uh, articulation of the reality in the vedas uh, we find in the nasadiya sukta the 10th mandala of uh, 
Rigveda and the Sukta number 129. So it is this Sukta which talks about the, you know, it's also talk, you know, said as the hymn of creation. So what could have been there? Na sadasi no sadasi dani yat. So, so uh, I've taken up the translation of it from uh, A.L. Basam's book, The Wonder That Was India. <coughs> it says that uh, then even nothingness was not, not, nor existence. There was no air then nor the heavens beyond it. What is, what covered it? Where was it? In whose keeping? We find that the narrative comes basically like this, that non-existence predominates over the existence. That means whatever exists in the world has come from something which is non-existence. That basically implies the Akasa Tattva, <coughs> that everything came into existence from the non-existence. <coughs> So that means uh, <coughs> non-existence has been given prominence over existence. This is the first articulation of, uh, you know, the reality in Indian tradition. In the Vedas, we find it. The second one is uh, there is a metaphorical suggestion of uh, uh, inverted banyan tree which means that uh, you know that trunk branches fruits leaves etc are in this world but the roots are somewhere in the unmanifest even sankhya also has a concept like uh, mula prakriti there is a prakriti which is there with us and then there is a mula prakriti we have it in gita and also in the rig veda such narratives are there where it has been very, very metaphorically, it has been suggested like this. So, Nasadiya Sukta and the inverted banyan tree are very metaphoric suggestions of it. The third uh, articulation of the notion of reality is it pertains to Rita. And this is something which is very important one because uh, uh, Rig Veda advocates Rita which stands for whole cosmic order, moral order, and God, God Varun as its guardian. It is known as Sat, Param, Mahan, and manifest, but not, you know, includes uh, Sangathan, Vile, order, system, nature. In, you know, it is uh, there since creation. So uh, it has given birth to gods and goddesses. That's another aspect of it. And it is the law operating between karma and its fallen. The duty of Purush is to protect the cosmic order. This is something very important one. Because if there is anybody who can violate the Ritas, so it's only the, uh, the Purush, the human beings who can violate it. So it's the, it's the duty of the Purush, it's the dharma of the Purush to protect the Ritas. So that there should be essential unity between sentient and non-sentient being. <laughs> now, uh, it is also said that uh, Rita is, uh, gives uh, rise to nature, Prakriti. And Prakriti is a gift to humanity. So, uh, with Rita, we find that uh, the concept of Dharma also originates along with Rita. Because uh, Rita generally uh, manifests, uh, talks about the cosmic order, but uh, within that cosmic order, the dharma comes also, you know, like the Purush is, is the one who can protect the Ritas. They should not violate the Rita. And uh, nature is a gift from Ritas. And uh, Purush is uh, supposed to have, uh, you know, uh, enjoy the gift of nature, but in such a way, that in nature is protected and it flourishes on its own. So 
Now the second aspect, which the third aspect, which comes up along with that about after the Rita, is the concept of dhar dharma. <coughs> and dharma is something which is very much quite handy. One can have it, you know, work work with it. So as Kalad has uh, said in the Vaisheshik Sutra, yado abhyudaya nishreyasthi di tado tad dharma. So abhyudaya means achievements, dharma arts and kama, uh, these are the achievements. And then we have nishreyas that attainment or fulfillment. We generally have two tier value system in Indian tradition. And dharma operates at both the levels. So <coughs> Dharma does not mean religion kind of a thing because religion has a, a monastery life and it has certain do's and don'ts. But a dharma is something which is embedded in the in the in the life as such, kind of a thing, dharmic life. That is dhriti, chama, dhamma, asti, sauch, indriya, negra. So etc. You know these are the Ten Daskam Dharma Lakshadam. So there are ten such features of the Dharma. Now, <coughs> Manu Smriti has given a detailed analysis of this kind of phenomenon and that Dharma leads towards Chitta Suddhi. But the important thing which I would like to place uh, uh, before you is that, uh, uh, that there is a questioning to understand the notion of reality. And that's something very wonderful contribution of Indian philosophy, that there are questions, there are counter questions, there are, you know, some questions which are of, you know, ati prasna kind of a thing. So people have just no answer to all these things. But the questioning is something as an inquiring act is something very fundamental uh, to uh, this kind of a effort to understand the notion of reality there. So the questions in the Upanishads are not shallow uh, kind of a curiosity type questions pertaining to who said it, what, what does it mean, when and where, uh, why and how, etc. These questions are far deeper ones. Dealing with the purpose of life, ways to get everlasting joy, source of creation, Brahman, Atman, etc. That is churned out of, uh, churned out only after some serious reflection about it. Even there is one Upanishad entitled as Prashna Upanishad. It is full of, you know, questions uh, there from beginning to the end. The Upanishads deal with questions which arise when men begin to, you know, reflect seriously and uh, they attempt to find out the answers of everything. <clears throat> so it, it is a, an act of you know, very serious uh, reflection about it. Bhagavad Gita also has a number of questions which are there around almost 27, 28 questions are there which have been asked and <clears throat> So uh, then these questions have been then very seriously reflected upon. What is important in the act of questioning about the notion of reality is that it pertains to the jnana mark of Indian tradition. So all the questions are representing the, you know, is very, very serious vichar about it. So the questions were permitted and presented logically in the knowledge tradition, universally termed as the path of knowledge, that is Jnana Marga. This path of inquiry, that is vichar, gets a tread mostly by those who have a natural inclination, intellectual inclination to think and analyze their way in their seeking. <coughs> There is no question of blind faith, kind of a, no dogma uh, kind of a thing in seeking. There is no question of blind faith or dogma in, the, in this path. As the teacher of the Upanishads points out, uh, points out the way uh, in the most logical manner that appeals to uh, 
rational intellect. Quite often uh, in the Upanishads, one finds directed questions asked by the seeker of the truth. And uh, sometimes, you know, uh, some indirect questions are also raised. But the thing is that to check the exceptional ability and the earnestness of both the teacher and the seeker, <coughs> seeker of it. Now, in this context, there is one more thing which has to be kept in the mind. Is that when Vedas are all Samhitas, but when Samhita means a collection and compilation of ideas, conceptions from diverse schools of thought which are there, then there is an attempt to uh, do Mimansha aspect of it. So that Mimansa aspect is something which is the, you know, binding thread to all the diverse viewpoints which are there. So Samhita and Mimansa could be taken, taken to overcome most of the dichotomies because in Indian philosophy, we do not find any dichotomy the way it happens in the West. Because in the West, people begin philosophy by dichotomizing it. But in Indian philosophy, in Indian philosophy and in the Vedic Upanishadic tradition, uh, we do not find any kind of a dichotomy. Differences are there, but they are not dichotomized between norms and facts, between rationalism and empiricism, and so forth. So pluralism is the act of philosophizing about it. The different mandalas of the Rig Veda have been attributed to different schools and groups of intellectuals. Even Yajur Veda, Chak, Samhita, everything is a sam Samhita kind of a thing. So, and once these views are compiled, then there is a rigorous attempt to critically examine them. That is the Mimansa aspect of it. Some of the questions, at least at least one question I would like to take up uh, for the purpose of this uh, presentation today, and that is the notion of Atman, ko aham. It begins with an inquiry into the knowledge of one's own self. <coughs> and there is a various dialogues which are there because these views are not pertaining to any kind of a commandment, but the dialogic effort is involved into it and uh, uh, to know about the oneself. And uh, this thing, uh, we have metaphorically found it, it has been suggested by many, many people, like in the, in the you know, Vedanta Congress, we have got the metaphoric suggestion or the symbolic representation of uh, two birds, Dwa Suparna. So in the, this has been taken from Mundaka Upanishad. So, uh, so one who is eating the ripe grapes and the other is just looking at it. So these are the Jiva and the Atman within oneself. So one is doing all sorts of things and the other is simply the witness aspect of it. So let us see how it has been formulated and presented before us. But before I go to that, there is yet another concept which has been uh, bothering quite quite a uh, few of us. That is, what is the role of the mind or the manas into it? Because manas is very instrumental for conceptualizing the notion of reality. <clears throat> so in the Siva Sankalpa Sukta, chapter 35 of the uh, Sukla Ezur Veda, so sixth mantra, so it has detailed analysis of uh, what is the role of mind. They call it mind as the source, as the controller and the regulator of internal perceptions of pleasure, pain, desire, emotions, you know, patience, fear, satisfaction, doubt, well-being. The list goes on. It's a very exhaustive kind of a thing. So the suggestion is that in order to uh, in addition to organic food which we eat, but we also need food from mind, from speech, from knowledge, etc. That also is some kind of, you know, thirst which is needed for us. So mind is like the charioteer. These are the metaphoric representations of it. We find it in the West also in Plato's Republic, that mind is regarded as, in Plato, there are only three senses, but here we have five senses which are there. So sometimes it is said in a very paradoxical manner that mind is near, mind is far off, mind is all the time awake, it is the sources of all illumination. <coughs> so 
So it means that uh, uh, you, you need a Bhashyakaras to interpret it that in what sense it is near and in what sense it is far off. And Shankaracharya has done a comprehensive uh, analysis of it, uh, you know, when he was giving a Bhashya of the Upanishad Bhashya kind of a thing. Now, uh, I am uh, have only two or three more slides. That is uh, the metaphysical status of the Atman, uh, how it is there and what 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 exactly is the status of it. Status of it. So the first thing is the Tattva Viveka Ka. So it's kind of Tattva and again pertaining to the notion of reality, which I've been uh, trying to explore from the Vedic Nishadik perspective. So it comes to this level of uh, that uh, what is the uh, inquiry into the truth? Then Atmam Satyam Tadanet Sarva Mithyaji. It is uh, the firm conviction that the self is real and all other than the self that is unreal. In Within the categories of real and unreal, this is how we go about it. Then the question is that what is uh, Atman or the self? And the answer is that which is other than the grass, subtle, and causal, causal bodies, beyond the five bodily seeds, the witness of the three states of consciousness, waking, dream, and deep sleep, and of the nature of existence, consciousness, and bliss. So this is the broad definition of the Atman, and it has further been uh, elaborated that if the Atman is like this, then uh, then what is the self? They say self is Sat Chit Anand. Now the question is what is Sat? Sat means existence, something which exists exists in all the uh, three tenses of the universe, past, present, and the future. Then what is consciousness? Consciousness is the absolute awareness of knowing, kind of thing. Without consciousness, awareness will not emerge. And Ananda is the bliss aspect of it. So Satachit Anandam, that kind of a thing comes out. And then it has been uh, elaborated in the, you know, with the help of the Upanishads and their Bhasikaras that uh, the Upanishadic saints try to impart knowledge of the Atman or the Absolute to his pupil through the method of a dialogue. Uh, an example can be found in the Brihadaranak Upanishad uh, between the, the dialogue between, uh, you know, uh, Yagya Velke and his wife Maitreya uh, about the notion of uh, self. Yeah, and this is something very fundamental kind of a thing. And uh, various other narratives can be found, uh, particularly with reference to the consciousness, avasthatraya. So the three conditions of awareness, waking, dreaming, deep sleep. Turiya is something which is the absolute one, uh, where in fact, uh, so uh, <clears throat> the Turiya state is, is something which is uh, consciousness is left to itself. This is trans empirical, trans rational, trans linguistic, because even language will not uh, em uh, yeah, op operate there, work there. The seventh mantra of the Mandukya Upanishad says that Turiya state could be mystical state through meditation, etc. If you, one has it, one has it, one doesn't have it, one doesn't have it. So it is adrishyam, abhyavharyam, agrahyam, alakshanam, achintam, shantam, shivam, advaitam, etc. It is at this stage that the Atman is to be entirely identified with the Brahman. In other words, if I am the Atman and Atman is absolute, then it follows syllogistically that I am the absolute. Aham, I am Brahman. Aham, Brahmasmi. So this kind of a narrative is something which is uh, profoundly uh, there in the Vedic Upanishadic tradition of the notion of reality. With this, I thank you very much again to Professor Sasiti Variji and the team which has been working for the waves. And uh, I think my time is also up. So thank you very much.